like say, you know, a karate lesson, 50 bucks, list it, and that, you know, that'll be easier to sell than getting people to post tasks. And Rolf Hansen, the CEO of Amazing, goes, nah, that's a shit idea. <laughs> like, <laughs> I wouldn't invest in it. He's like, that's not awesome. Airtask is awesome. People being able to post whatever they want, love that. I'm yeah. in. He's like, karate lesson? <laughs> nah. <laughs> like, give me my money back. They're doing karate lessons. <laughs> Call me Bucky New, lucky that I'm innocent. Uh, if I didn't have no morals, I'd be innocent. Uh, how about Welcome everyone to another episode of Soul Therapy. Today I have a very special guest. I have the founder and CEO of Airtasker, but also my mentor and role model and just a awesome guy that I look up to and like to be friends with, but you know, he calls me young and he's like, one day I'm gonna get old and, <laughs> and be, be like him. So, um, but yeah, no, Tim, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I thought I'd have you on the show because not many people know, but you're a, you're a closet hype beast. Um, I know you have a lot of vape, a lot of, I'm sure that's Patagonia or something, right? Like, I'm aspiring, mate. This is, yeah, you're right, it is Patagonia. <laughs> and I got, I think, but I got Uniqlo on top. So. Uh, okay, yeah, you're trying to keep it humble, but, but keep it real. I, know, I know you're a closet. <laughs> mate, it's um, a macroeconomic downturn. <laughs> Yeah, say we we've all gonna all gonna dress down, but um yeah, and you've got the bait glasses, which if you guys can't see, he's got you know bait glasses, which he, he said uh is because of Zoom meetings, but they're they're pretty hype, they're bait and, and they look good. He, he's he does he wants to be low key and he doesn't want to stand out too much, which is uh one of the things I love about him. He's just so humble, like you're yeah. you're always so humble. Like yeah. when I talk to people about you, right, and and they're always like, oh yeah, you know, I know Tim. The first thing that they say is that like he's a really intelligent guy, right? And and I see that too, right? I'm not, I'm not saying I don't see. That. <laughs> I see it. Yeah. I see it. You're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> but, but like, I, I guess for me, it's like, I want to dig into why, I guess, how you became who you are. Like, I guess when someone looks at your resume, it doesn't really show a, I guess, a linear story, right? Like you've gone through and, and done so many different things. And I want to understand effectively how you became Tim Boom. Like, what was the start? And were you always entrepreneurial? Or were, were you, you know, kind of found yourself into it? And, and I've always wanted to ask you this even previously, but how have you developed to think like you do, right? Like that's the main thing for me. Like I'm like, I always ask you for advice and I feel like I'm always trying to ask myself like, what would Tim do? And I, I think I'm starting to grasp it, but I want to understand how you got there. So yeah, tell us about your journey. Well, first of all, thanks for the uh, for the good intro. Um, that's a G up. I was born here in, in Sydney, Australia. Pretty, pretty fortunate, you know. I grew up in St. Ives, which is a lovely leafy suburb on the North Shore, so I can't complain. The only thing I would actually complain about is pretty boring. You know, not not much happens. Uh, it's not there, just so, drama. Yeah, you gotta like look for stuff to go and to go and do. But I think that's a pretty first world problem. Went to public schools. You know, went to St Ives um, North, the local public school, and then I went to Ataman, which was a which was an OC class further down towards the city, and then um, went to North Sydney Boys for high school. Um, so I had a pretty, you know, pretty um, straightforward, you know, good public selective school education. Yeah. Went to uni, had no idea what I wanted to do for uni, and I did okay in the HSC, but when I actually went through the, um, the book and looked at, you know, where the, um, what, what courses I could get into, <laughs> um, I had no idea even after I'd gotten um, my HSE results and stuff. So I ended up doing um, a tourism and hospitality and marketing uh, degree at UNSW. Yeah. And the main reason was because they were like, oh, you get to do like wine tasting as part of the course <laughs> and you, know, you get to do all this cool stuff. So I was like, that sounds pretty good. Let's, yeah. let's go. So I did that. Um, and then they subsequently shut down the degree. <laughs> they're like, oh, it's not that it's good. <laughs> yeah, like the wine tasting thing. I did come first in the wine tasting though. So that was good. When I and, and, and then worked in investment banking for about five years. So, so. How did, okay, that's one of the first leaps, right? Like, mm. how do you go from tourism and marketing to investment banking? You know, for most people, that's not very conventional. You know, it's actually, it's, it's a bit that I actually did miss out on. So I was doing tourism and hospitality and marketing mm. where, when I worked for a boutique hotel in mm. Darlinghurst. It was completely serendipitous that I got this, this job, but the guy who owned uh, the hotel, it was only a 17 room, very small boutique hotel called the Altamont. And it was a man named Paul Fishman. And it was really interesting because he was, you know, I thought he was like an old guy but at the time he was only 27 <laughs> and he'd actually just ponied up to buy oh, wow. this this hotel like yeah. with his own money and like borrowed money and all that to do this and he's actually now gone on to own many 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 hotels all across the world so oh, wow. um, it was actually really lucky that I got to meet him yeah but basically as an entrepreneur he had me working you know 14 hours a day <laughs> 
I'm basically being the everything person for this hotel. Yeah. And I remember one of the days I was doing one of these long shifts, something came up on the UNSW jobs board and it was basically like, hey, there's this opportunity to go work for a company that's doing deals with Greg Norman, Steve Waugh, the cricketer, yeah. um, and all these like uh, interesting sports people and, and they own hotels and they own all of this stuff. And I was like, that sounds pretty awesome. It's like, very so, specific too, like to what you were doing. Yeah, it was really specific. So I, yeah. and, and, and the person who was um, actually going to, you know, um, select who would get this this role mm -hmm. was from my degree. Mm -hmm. And so I went and applied for it and it turned out that it was Macquarie Bank that at the time was, um, they had a department called the Golf and Leisure Department. And That's there cool. was, yeah. <laughs> and there was um, literally a team called the Leisure Investment Banking Team. Wow. And they would go around just buying up um, all kinds of leisure assets. Yeah. And so that's it was the hospitality angle that actually yeah, got me into okay. that. And yeah. then um, basically I went and spent the next five years doing spreadsheets and you know doing doing yeah. various things. And, and but I'll tell you what, Macquarie Bank uh, back in the early two thousands, mm -hmm. it was the place to be. It was it was really really incredible. It, it yeah. basically felt like you know they kind of had this big chunk of money. Mm -hmm. And then they'd kind of built this culture and this philosophy around having like entrepreneurial people yeah. basically being able to put up their hand and go like, I reckon we could do this with this money. Mm. So, you know, and then you know, they would, you would just have to write a paper and say, I want to do this with this money. And if you, if you could convince the, you know, the, the owners of the money, they'd, yeah. they'd give it to you. And so we did everything from, you know, doing a disabled taxi uh, business. Wow. Uh, we bought childcare centers. Uh, we bought AMF bowling. There was just so many of these interesting things and you yeah. just got to see how real entrepreneurs can operate. So was that your, kind of your first foray into entrepreneurship? Well, look, I'll tell you what, with the, um, entre you, you know, you asked before about, you know, are you born an entrepreneur or, you know, yeah. did you always want to be an entrepreneur? I think most entrepreneurs say the word entrepreneur is kind of like a bit, funny yeah, you know, yeah. No, no entrepreneur goes i'm an entrepreneur <laughs> I, I, like, feel, I i still struggle to call myself a founder yeah exactly yeah. it's just a funny kind of thing to say and yeah. um the way i think of it is like i did always have a diff i would generally stick to first principles and ask questions about how things worked mm -hmm. um when, when i ever since i've been young you yeah. know like you see something you're like why does it work like that and then yeah. You know, someone would tell you, oh, that's just because blah, blah, blah. And you'd be like, that, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. why don't we just do it this way instead of that way? Yeah. And I think that's probably the theme that just kind of carries through is just mm -hmm. like try to look at things from first principles. And if it makes sense to you, sure, do it that do way. It. And yeah. if it doesn't, then try to find a better way. And, and, and that often relates into businesses and stuff. Yeah. Um, but I reckon that's the sort of key, key theme. So ever since I've been a kid, you know, that was always mm -hmm. uh, a thing. I think the other thing that's probably related to that is, um, you know, I think I think um, being hungry to want to change things. Yeah. Um, and so I remember, you know, as a kid, if I wanted, you know, a GI Joe or something, and they didn't sell it at the local store, yeah. I was okay to call up the ten other stores and, you know, ask them, do you have this GI mm -hmm. Joe or whatever. Yeah. Whereas I think some people might just be like, ah, I can't be stuffed. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. No, 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 the one I want, damn it. Yeah. Go home. And then from investment banking, where did you go from there? Yes, yeah, so it's actually quite timely now. So 2008 uh, financial crisis, you know, the previous financial crisis. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, buying all those assets was really cool until you hit a wall and, <laughs> and, and it's suddenly the worst idea ever. So um, I left Macquarie and got made redundant uh, there. Uh, I wanted to be like Ari Gold from Entourage. I was, like, I was watching Entourage, it's like, that'd be awesome. Like, in, in a recession. Be, yeah, I was like, that'd be an awesome job to be like, you know, the boss of the celebrities and like cutting deals and stuff. So yeah. I went and applied to work at a bunch of um, talent representation agencies. Mm -hmm. And I was just really, really um, lucky um, that a woman named Ursula Hufnagel, who runs um, a modeling agency called Chic Management, yeah. um, which is in Malara. You know, I, I did it as a snail mail. Mm. Um, and she actually said, all right, fine, come in and we'll interview you. And um, wow. so I, I met her and I said, I'll do everything you want me to do for free. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm really good at doing PowerPoint presentations because I've just come out of <laughs> investment banking. So, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm a whiz at PowerPoints. And so I'll help you put together all the proposals and do all that for free. Mm -hmm. And it was just really lucky that her partner, the, the co-owner of the, the modeling agency, uh, was one of the founding directors of Optus. Mm. So he was like a really successful telco exec. He made, you know, 
made money doing other things. Yeah. And this was his kind of, you know, he'd obviously made money and then plowed it into another business. And um, he gave me the opportunity to work with him on a, on a startup. Um, so it was a company called Amazim. It's like a mobile SIM card yep. business. We started it at the back of the modeling agency. Um, I got the opportunity well. to work with some of the best founders, raised a bunch of money, mm -hmm. and um, I guess got to do a startup without being the, the CEO the first time around. Without so. having to deal with all the stress and all the... I'll tell you what, you know when you're, when you're the second in charge in a business or the third in charge in a <laughs> business, or you know, as I was probably, you know, number five or something, yeah. You look at the CEO and you're like, oh, that, that job looks pretty easy, you know? <laughs> you know, now that I look back, I was like, oh, geez, yeah, that would have been super stressful. Yeah. You know, all those moments that I thought, oh, it's pretty obvious, just do this or just do that. Mm. When you're the one who's actually got to make those decisions, um, yeah. it's, it, it is definitely different being in that role versus pretty much, you know, the other roles. When you just wanted to work with a modeling agency, you just did it. For most people, having a career change, you know, being in investment banking is pretty good money. Yeah. Like for you to just be like, screw it, I'll work for free. Yeah. How did you make that decision? So I think there's a bit of privilege in this, which, I, which I'd probably acknowledge, which is like I was living at home. Yeah. I was 24, 25, still living at home. And so I didn't have all the expenses. You know, I was able to take that plunge. So I, I want to acknowledge that first. Because yeah. not everyone can just say, you know what, I don't need the money. Yeah. You know, it wasn't because like we were loaded or anything. It was just that, like that the, there wasn't that insane pressure to yeah. pay your rent and do mm -hmm. all that because I because I lived at home. And but mon monetary, like monetary aside, right? Yeah. Like shifting your career. Like yeah, not many people I'm, can I'm do that, right? That. I'm down like, for that's that. That's what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah no. I, I think I really like learning and sort of reaching up. I think some people sort of like to potentially like get into a role so they can sort of cushion manage out. downwards and, yep. and cushion out. I'm kind of keen to be the dumbest person in the room and you know be reaching up and up and up to, mm -hmm. to find more and, and, and find other smart people who can teach us stuff. I actually quite like being in that position rather yep. than everyone's looking to you and saying, <laughs> are you the smartest guy here? Because then you, you, know, you, you know inside you're kind of like, Jeez, if this is as good as it gets, <laughs> that's a bit concerning. So, no, I just really like being in new environments, learning about about new yeah. things, and and I think um, that's kind of like what keeps me going in life. I reckon. Yeah, and then it's switching nice. again to go into a Mason, right? Like to go into a telco. Like that's yeah, that's not an obvious move, and it's and that's what always strikes me about you. Like it's not an obvious move, but it's also not a conventional move. But it's also like for you to just be like, you know, you, you could have built a, again built a career in managing talent, and yeah. then just going, you know what, I'm gonna run a. Yeah. Telco. Like, especially being young, kind of not knowing yourself, like, how did you, how did you make that decision? Like, that's an, another decision. And even though, you know, you had someone there that obviously could, could help shepherd that and he was, you know, the boss, but to still jump through and make that leap. Yeah, I think one thing that's pretty formative or, or one way that I think of things is you can definitely overanalyze things or overplan things. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, it's not very good use of time. There's yeah. a really good um, quote, you know, Planning is everything, the plan's nothing. Mm -hmm. um, which yep. is basically like you write down a plan mm -hmm. and by definition, you know, you can't control everything usually in a plan. And so mm -hmm. that's why everyone always says, as soon as you write the business case, it's wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, but as soon as you write the plan, it's wrong. The power's in constantly thinking about how you might move to, mm -hmm. to the next steps. And so the way I look at, you know, some of these sort of like life moments and stuff like that is you want to have like principles about what you care about. You know, I, I really care about knowing first principles about how stuff works. Yeah. I think money over the long run is important, but you know, over the short run, I don't really yeah, think it's, it's important. And then I think you want to be opportunistic and, you know, somewhat reactive to, to what happens. Yeah. Um, understanding that, you know, in life, 97% of it you don't control anyway. Yeah. So getting comfortable with that fact, you don't control most of this. So you can kind of have a North Star principles that, that guide your direction, but then in what you actually do, mm -hmm. I think you actually want to be responsive to what's going on. And I think in most of these opportunities, it was, oh geez, that's an opportunity. Let's go. Like, you yeah. know, meet the Peter O'Connell, the, the owner of, of Chic, and I'm like, this guy sounds amazing. Like, sounds super <laughs> smart. What yeah. can I do for that guy? You know, can I, yeah. And it's funny because I ended up, I think I ended up tutoring his kids <laughs> uh, or what? finding him a tutor for his kids. And then yeah. I would, you know, I, I was basically like, whatever you need me to do, I'll just go do it because um, this sounds like you know, it's seeds. such an opportunity to get behind him. Yeah, this sounds like the seeds for Airtask because it's for every job that you go to, you're like, I will do whatever you want. Yeah, yeah, whatever you need, mate. That's, that's, <laughs> yeah. that, that's my other life philosophy. Yeah. yeah, well, okay. And then what did you learn at Amazing? 
What we did with the Maysim was there were these four German founders who built a business in, in Europe called, called Simio. And what we wanted to do was basically bring them to us. So we were like, that is a brilliant idea. Can you bring that to Australia? We'll raise the money. We'll cut you a telco deal. You've just got to come and pretty much do what you did before, but do it again faster, better, harder in, in Australia. Yeah. And I think one of the things that I learned that was really amazing was it came with the founding team. So there was four of them. There was the CFO, the CMO, the COO and the CEO. Your C-suites kind of said. Yeah, so yeah. we're just like, those four, all of you have to come together mm. and, you know, get paid a lot of money and, and all this kind of stuff. But I think what was really powerful is um, they had flow between them. And that is, you know, I, I've learned in, in building leadership teams and stuff, that's really unique and rare and hard to build. It takes a long time. And frankly, you know, I've gotten it wrong time and time and time again. It's it's so hard to get that team to have flow. And, and so I think one of the big learnings was, you know, being able to just have that yeah. um, straight up was super, super valuable. And it just allowed us to move like so, so fast. And how do you build that? Gee, so they, uh, the CEO of, of Amazing was a guy named Rolf Hansen, who's like a super, super inspiring entrepreneur. Uh, you know, people used to call him like the Richard Branson of Germany or, well, or okay. whatever. He was like a really uh, charismatic mm -hmm. CEO. His thing was that he would only work sort of like four days a week, very relaxed. He'd <laughs> he's go, a pioneer. Go surfing. <laughs> That's all, yeah, all exactly. the page. <laughs> he started the working from home, working four days a week. No, but he was like, um, you know, he'd be like, I gotta go surfing, I gotta see my family. But he would definitely be in that ilk of people who could really focus in and just worry about the stuff that mattered. Mm -hmm. Like, it'd be like, that thing really matters. We're going to really focus on that and we're going to get that thing done. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that was really powerful because he could build trust, you know, that he had consistency, this is what I care about. And then from there, he would really trust the team. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not sure if it's chicken and egg, you know. I have been learning, been wondering, you know, can you give trust first or is trust earned over time? You know, do you have to start with trust or, or, yeah. or do you actually start with no trust and, and build it up over time? Yeah, I guess I didn't see how the cookie, you know, was was baked right from the beginning, but, but certainly the fact that he was able to build trust with that team made them, you know, be able to go at light speed. Mm. And what was after Amazing? So as part of Amazing, I bought in a uni mate of mine, um, John O'Louis. Mm -hmm. And it was because basically we're in this um, startup. There's four of us in the, uh, that's by Doug Harvey. Um, there, there's, we're working in a shoebox and the COO of Amazing comes up to me and goes, hey, we need a project manager who, who knows about tel telecoms engineering. Mm -hmm. And I was like, my mate from uni has exactly <laughs> that degree. <laughs> like, yeah. um, and so I called up my mate Jono and I said, hey, you should join this Amazing thing. Like we've been doing it for six months or whatever, come in and it's gonna be great. You're gonna be like numbers two in this in this startup and so he came in and then we basically built you know the foundations of the company scaled it hired all the people and scaled it to like 50,000 customers or something mm. in about six months after wow. launching it so it was like super fast because these guys knew what they were doing yeah and then John and I were like this is kind of done eh <laughs> we're kind of like we've, we've We've, we've kind of we built the company. Success. Well, no, it was like in terms of the company, like it was like now we're working for a telco. Like it was fun whilst we were like raising money, phase, building yeah. offices, um, you know, hiring people. But then once it was a business, we're like, ah, oh, we want to be building stuff. You know, every day we'd have our coffee at ten o'clock or whatever. We'd just talk about all these different ideas. We had a different idea before Airtask, it was, it's terrible. We started going down that track, I'm so glad we didn't. Mm -hmm. um, I was moving apartments and I asked a mate to come and help me move. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not Jono, it's another, another mate of ours, Ivan. The reason I asked my mate to help me move is because he's got this truck that he uses to do um, deliveries. Yeah. He, he does um, frozen chicken nuggets and, and wow. croquette. You know, when you're still young, you're like, I don't want to hire a white glove you know, $1,000 a day yeah. removalist. I my was stuff's like, not even worth that much. Yeah, I just like, I, I, yeah, exactly. I got this <laughs> crappy couch and stuff. Anyway, so we just literally put all the stuff in the back of the refrigerated truck. Mm -hmm. It does stink like chicken, but um, we, took it all, we took it all out. And then it was just like, you know, why is it, why, why are we doing this? Yeah. Like, why would I ask you when I could ask somebody else who mm -hmm. I'm not annoying, yeah. you know, to, to do these kinds of jobs. And it's probably hard for you to believe, you know, different uh, <laughs> generation. But before sort of 2010, mm -hmm. the internet was mostly like pseudonyms, forums, yep. you know, nicknames. I, and, and I was on forums. I was yeah, sure. I was on um, oh, the Peppa a, Pig one or something. <laughs> <laughs> there was a Warcraft forum. Yeah, yeah. Dota forum. It was called yeah. Board Aussies. I don't know if you, yeah. anyone knows about it. Yeah. It used to be huge back then. Right. And yeah, it just, well, it was like yeah. IRC and, and, you know, ICQ and all that sort of stuff yeah. in, in my generation. But 
basically it, it had nothing to do with your real life like there was a separation between yeah. real life identity and online identity and so uh, around those 2010s you really had the facebooks the linkedins mm -hmm. and all that start to go oh yeah online identity is just your you know your real life identity yeah like our thought was hey if all of those data points are coming online you should be able to stitch all of that together into like a trusted community type uh, framework. And so that was sort of the, the birth of Airtasker. Yeah, wow. How did you feel at, when you were like, hey, let's do this? Like, and that's, a, that's another jump, right? Another leap of faith. Yeah. What, what were you feeling like to do that? Because you could have gone back, got a job, keep, keep working at a comfy telco. You know what's so interesting is in your life, it's often that you remember these moments as if they were singular moments, but they were actually not usually singular moments. Yeah. You know, like a decision to leave a company is usually, you know, it's three months of thinking about it. Do yep. I do this? Do I not? Then you, mm -hmm. you finally go do it. So it's interesting for us. <clears throat> so first of all, I told you we had this, this other idea. We kind of went down that path and then we're both like, oh, this is not a good idea. Let's not do it. And we actually quit our jobs at Amazon. We actually went to the founders <laughs> well. of Amazon. We're like, yeah, we're out. <laughs> and they were like, holy crap. These are my, these are the two guys, you know, these, you know, because we were the formative team, yeah. for one and two employees. And so they were kind of having a meltdown and we go, we're out. And then about two weeks later, we said, the idea that we had sucks. Can we have our jobs back? <laughs> and they were like, fine. Yeah, your jobs back. <laughs> <laughs> and we're like, they're like, you better stick around for at least six months. We're like, fine, stick around for six months. And then I remember we came up with the idea for Airtasker. And that, that took a while, actually, to yeah. go from, hey, maybe this is a thing mm -hmm. to like, let's go do it. Yeah. And, um, you know, I pitched it to a bunch of people, just asking friends and stuff like that. And we were fine. I we might have a go at this. Mm -hmm. And I remember we then quit our jobs again. <laughs> so we go to the guys <laughs> like, hey, we're quitting again, sorry. And they were like, fine, we knew it, but let us invest in your company. Okay. So they said, let us pay you your salaries for another three months. Mm -hmm. You have to stay in our office and work from our office so that we can come and tap you on the shoulder if we, we need you for something. But we get it as equity in the company. Mm. And um, yeah, it was actually really smarter than yeah. they ended up like 10 x the money or whatever in like a year and a half. Like, and no. they got you there to yeah, no. answer any questions. No, it was sick. Um, <laughs> they should have kept their stock actually. But anyway, we kind of had agreed to do it. And I remember going on holidays. Uh, I was in New York actually, just with my wife, just for total fun, uh, which is what you can do before you start a company. You can actually go and have fun. So I was on like um, a holiday and then this wave just came over me where I was just like, holy crap, how are we going to get people to post tasks on this website? Because like, I was like, it all makes sense. Everything about Airtask is like fairly sensible. Yeah. On the presumption that people you can get customers. To, to post jobs, yep. you know, and, and you're not just so, kind of saying to a customer, hey, look at this amazing shoe, you should buy it. Yeah. You're kind of saying, can you tell me what you want? <laughs> and I was kind of like, and I guess I want to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I kind of had this like, like massive panic attack actually I was just like wow. oh my god like and I started like you know you start writing down the maths you're like okay so like you know if you got to pay 10 people it probably <laughs> cost you like 80 grand a month if the average task is I don't know like 50 bucks and you charge 20% is 10 bucks let's all your cost so it's like 8 bucks a task and then you're like I think the math is something like I think we need 100,000 tasks a month <laughs> for this thing to be remotely wow. have a chance. And, and so it was like generally like a minor panic attack. Mm -hmm. And I actually went back and I was like, and, and actually this is an interesting thing to, to recount on. I actually said, hey, maybe we should change the model. Maybe we should change the model to let's actually make it that taskers can say what they can do mm -hmm. and they can offer kind of like a lesson like say, you know, a karate lesson, 50 bucks, list it, and that's what, you know, that'll be easier to sell than getting people to post tasks. Mm. And Rolf Hansen, the CEO of Amazing, goes, nah, <laughs> shit idea. Like, <laughs> I wouldn't invest in it. He's like, that's not awesome. Like, <laughs> Airtask is awesome. People being able to post whatever they want, love that. I'm yeah. in. He's like, karate lesson? <laughs> nah. <laughs> like, give my money back. We're doing karate lessons. <laughs> and so... Um, that's a job, boy. <laughs> yeah, he's like, he's like, nah, it's just not that cool. Like, yeah. And so... um. And so, you know, I, I was like, like, I'll go back to, to the original idea. And then I remember we needed money. W one thing about this, Jono and I knew, it's like, you can't start this thing without raising some money. Mm -hmm. There was this great character that we'd met along the way of building a Maysim. His name was Thomas Falk. Okay. He was only about three years older than us, but he yep. was like a couple of hundred millionaire. Wow. Um, and he bu actually built a company that a Google acquired back in 2000 and eight or something yeah well wow. and so he was just like angel investing in everything and so since we knew him we pitched him air task out he's like first of all i'm out <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a good yeah, start like, sorry so i just want to let you know that <laughs> second of all 
I reckon what you should do is like raise like five mil and then have a really good time for the next few years, like having a crack at this because I don't think it's going to work. Wow. Like, so just like go hard at it. You know, and he wasn't being facetious, mm. but it's essentially like go hard, have fun, have a party as you do this because they say this is going to be really hard. Mm. And, um, and so at that point, Jono and I really had this kind of existential moment where we we're kind of like, are we going to do this or not? Because it's a big jump if we do it. And this guy's just absolutely slammed us. Yeah. Like we literally came out of that meeting and uh, we went and had a beer and we just said, you know, let's go. Like, <laughs> let's forget about that. Let's just, let's just charge on this. Yeah. And then what was the first kind of inklings of this working? Like, how, where, where were you then? Most people say like social products, super hard. Two-sided marketplaces, super hard. Yeah. And Airtasker is pretty much the epitome of social and two-sided yeah. to a T. It's pretty much equivalent to someone saying, hey, you're going to start a social network. It's probably one tier easier than starting your own social network. Yeah. So it took us ages, basically. The first couple of years were actually quite dark, I would say. You know, like, yeah. you raise money. It was good that we raised money because, yeah. one, we needed it. Two, it kept the pressure on to just keep, you know, keep going. Um, keep going. But it was pretty dark, I gotta say. What do you mean by dark? No silver bullets. On a daily rate, you would look at the numbers and basically there would often be times where four months later, you're, you're doing worse than you were doing, you know, four months earlier. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the chart, it, it looks like this, yep. you know, going up. Mm -hmm. spiking up and spiking down and stuff. But I can tell you when you're on those little crests and each one of those little data points is, is one day the end of sales, the world, right? Yeah, every day you're like, <laughs> we're down 40% from yesterday. <laughs> Shite, like is this a is this a trend or, yeah. or, or what is it? Also, it turns out that services is incredibly seasonal. Mm -hmm. You know, like spring and summer yeah. is where everyone does stuff. Uh, autumn and winter, nobody does anything, you know, mm -hmm. from a services perspective. And so, yeah, it was just really hard sort of being on that. And, you know, I probably got PTSD from every day uh, or every at least every Sunday night you know refreshing the numbers <laughs> I know seeing how feeling. you went for the week <laughs> and just like ah oh, I gotta haul my butt in to work again mm -hmm. and then I gotta go in and try and inspire seven or eight people to actually want to go do this yeah. and you know the self-doubt of is it actually a thing yeah you know it's pretty much happened every day and especially when you have the experience of amazing where yeah. it's like instant success yeah right did you was, was that hard or I think we knew Airtasker was gonna be hard and we knew it was different from Amazim because yeah. Amazim was like, it's a known segment. Mm -hmm. You know, you're trying to do something and do it better. Mm -hmm. It's probably more evolution. Airtasker was like revolution yeah. type stuff. You know, you tell people to post a task, I was like, what does that mean? We knew it was going to be harder. We had no delusions about that. I would say if we had had the opportunity to give up, we probably would have taken it ASAP. <laughs> but, I, but that is why I think it actually isn't a bad thing to kind of self-commit yourself, either raising capital or telling someone about your idea, it kind of holds you to account. It locks you in, right? It locks you in. And mm -hmm. and I think if you can kind of live with the that knife edge of, it's kind of okay to fail, but also you should try really, really hard not to fail. Mm -hmm. You know, that's probably one of the things that the good founders know. It's like, that's, it is okay to fail. Yeah. But only, I think, if you have pushed really, really hard to make sure that that's not the case. Exactly. You know? And then at the end of that, sure. You fail, no problem. And, yeah. and that's what John I said. We're like, it's okay if we fail, as long as we've sweated everything we possibly can to make this work, yeah. then we can say that we failed and, and that's okay. But yeah, it's pretty hard. When and how did those dark times change? Like where was the first inkling of like, hey, this might be Mate, they something. They keep coming back. <laughs> 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 no, um, look, I'd say the first two years really, really did feel like, oh my gosh, we're just doing this and we're doing it for nothing. You know, mm. you just like every day doesn't feel like much. Yeah, probably about two years in, we started to go like, oh, hold on. Some of these things, if we do more of that, we're getting a bit more of this. Mm -hmm. It was never a silver bullet. I, I don't think Airtasker has ever been about silver bullets. It's yeah. always been about just doing things a little bit better every day and trying a lot of new things. But yeah, it's probably about two years in and, you know, we're 10 and a half years in now. So it's been a, it's been a long journey to, to get it. To and years. what changed? I would actually characterize it more this way. It's a journey. Yeah. And I think every year of building a startup, mm -hmm. certainly from the position, you know, I only have my own perspective, but you know, as the, the founder CEO, it just changes every year. So mm -hmm. I wouldn't say it was kind of like one period and another period. I'd be more like each year is kind of defined by, you know, something that happened. And yeah. for us, you know, in those early days, it was mainly raising money. You know, mm -hmm. it would be kind of like, oh, we're this kind of startup with this kind of stuff, and then we'd hit a milestone, raise some money, and it'd be like, great, celebrate a little. But then, you know, the stakes would just get upped. Harder. And actually for the first eight years, the burn rate was basically increasing every year, not mm -hmm. decreasing, which was kind of 
normal back then. Now that I actually look back from, from where we stand today, I think we were incredibly fortunate that we got to live through a period where generally venture capital was growing in Australia mm -hmm. and things were going up and to the right in general. Mm -hmm. Building a marketplace, you know, you guys go through that now. It's hard, you know, when you hit one of these, you know, macro downturns or these these hard things, it's a, it's a massive challenge. And, yeah. and we were pretty lucky, I think, that we got eight years of sort of clear running mm -hmm. um, before before things got hard. Yeah, okay. That's that's so interesting. And I guess, when did you feel like you were a real CEO? Because uh, you're going through, you know, it is a journey and every year you kind of level up. But you know, I guess this is a loaded question, but was there one part of that where you're like, actually, now it's this is a real business? You also think about that, that whole real CEO and like imposter syndrome kind of thing. Yeah. I think it's the point at which you realize that, you know, there are different kinds of CEOs mm -hmm. and, you know, you can you just got to actually get the job done kind of thing. Like that's <laughs> yeah. the job of being the CEO. Yeah. And that can come in many shapes and forms. And like mm -hmm. often CEOs are great people managers. Sometimes they're great strategists. Sometimes they're, you know, great at raising money or whatever. I think it's that point that you realize that, that you might actually be able to call yourself a real CEO because <laughs> you've, you've realized you're not trying to emulate something else or try to be something else. It's like mm -hmm. actually looking first principles, what's the problem here? What are we trying to solve and, and go do it? Am I a perfect CEO? for sure not I think you're uh, pretty good like, no 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 I think you're <laughs> No way. Like, I mean, and you know, I think, you know, from the outside, it's a good point. From the outside, things always look cleaner than, than on the inside. But no, I, I would say not with fake humility, with actual humility. Mm. You know, I just meet so many CEOs. You're like, oh my gosh, they, they look like- That's how I feel when I talk to you. Oh well, yeah. And I'll tell you what, that never ends. Because <laughs> I just meet other guys and I'm like, oh my God, they sound so much more polished. They and, know what they're know, doing. They're doing. Holy yeah. crap. Yeah. I guess maybe it's also noting that everyone's kind of telling you they know what they're doing <laughs> and they don't. So. Yeah, okay. So that was an early day. <laughs> You're just staring at me. Yeah, like, yeah, ah. I'm just like, this is normal. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. So those were the early days of your journey. What was it like transitioning into a public facing CEO and, a, a pub, and running a public company? Like, was it a stark contrast? Yeah, I'll go back a couple of years before then. So basically, you know, the first six, seven years was basically the, you know, it was all about raising venture money. And so it was sort of do a round, hire more people, start doing more marketing, invest more into product, burn more money, and sort of just wind that up and up and up. So as yep. the revenue and the GMV sort of uh, grew. But so was the burn rate. 2019 came around. I remember we were burning about two million bucks a month, and uh, and look, I think there's two lenses you can have on that. If you actually zoom out and you look at it as like you know Silicon Valley venture starts like two million a month, 25 million a year. You know when you see people raising 100 mil, yeah, it's probably because they're burning something in the order of one eighteenth of that yes. per month. Correct. But as a founder, as an individual. Like, that's a lot of money. Like that's <laughs> crazy. And yeah. we made a very sharp decision at that point in time to get profitable. Because mm -hmm. we're like, we can't keep doing this. Like we're gonna be run out of money in six months. We're dead if we don't get profitable. Mm -hmm. So we actually put together a plan. And I remember the plan distinctly. This was in April 19. If we do everything right, we're gonna be profitable by October 2021. <laughs> I remember like the team just looking at me just going, that's like a really, really long time like, <laughs> to do that. But it was actually a really good thing because so what we did is we sort of anchored the whole company around Get Profitable. And at that point, we um, we actually didn't have to let people go. We did shut down one of our offices in, in the UK. Um, so there, there were a couple of people let go as part of that, but we didn't have to do like mass layoffs or anything. We reviewed our pricing. We built a couple of features into the product that, that really, really um, uh, helped us to grow volume. Mm -hmm. And by the end of the year, about nine months later, we were profitable. Then that sort of takes us up to, to early 2020. And as you know, you'd remember, COVID basically hits. We're like, oh, you know, this is like seriously scary stuff. Yeah. This is existential because we're an in-person network and you know, they've literally said everyone stay at home. And so we thought we were done. Uh, and, and we had sort of started forecasting, oh, could we survive, you know, three or four months without any revenue at all kind mm. of coming in? Uh, but it actually turned around and, and it, what it turns out is commute, like social marketplaces are really hard to get started. Yeah. But the good thing is that once they're going, it's actually not you the platform that's doing much it's actually the users who are doing all the the work and interacting together and so when covid came around 
our taskers just changed the way that they went about doing business and our customers just started asking for different kinds of jobs. Mm. And so the marketplace actually carried on and, and that was, and you know, we were cash flow positive at the time, so it was wow. like fantastic. And then we were like, well, how are we gonna scale this thing into other countries? Because, you know, basically this thing that we're doing in Australia it makes sense to be doing it in other countries. There actually isn't an air tasker in the UK or the US or anything why, like that. Why do you think there's not? Air taskers built on some pretty unintuitive principles, I yeah. think, or unintuitive things that are, that are true, but are not obvious and, and almost impossible to sort of justify uh, at the beginning. So a good example of that, one is that our marketplace is a community marketplace, meaning that we are not an agency, we don't go and uh, employ all of our taskers. We're just like, it's a community platform, do what you want. We're, we're holding you accountable if something goes wrong, but you know, do what you want in, in the first yeah. instance. And I think most people think that if you do that, people will do the wrong thing. But what we thought is, no, I think most people would do the right thing. Um, the second thing that I think is um, unintuitive about Airtasker is we're horizontal as a platform. Most people think it's a good idea to zoom in and niche as much as you can. But our niche is the fact that there are a lot of services that don't fit into any other niche. Mm. And so that literally is kind of like the differentiating thing is Airtasker um, lets you do all of these jobs which you can't get done in any sort of existing um, format. Yeah. And it turns out that that is actually very, very large in, in, in the services space. So that's why no one's sort of doing it in the US and the UK. So yeah, that sort of um, was the reason why we, we wanted to list the company. Afterpay um, was going gangbusters, basically being able to raise money and you know use it to grow and then do it again. Yeah. And so we saw that, and and that's what we sort of went after. And you know we had you know we had about nine months of that being the story, and and actually it was good. We were able to raise money uh, on the stock exchange and invest that into growing in the in the US. Yeah. Um, but obviously, you know, for the last year and a half, it's been you know pretty pretty bad. But you know, I think again. As a CEO, looking at the bigger picture, mm -hmm. if you're worried about what's happening in the next six months, and then sometimes you do worry mm -hmm. about that, but it's not conducive to, to actually doing a good job, I think. You know, you want to yeah. be looking at over 10 years, and when I look at Airtask over 10 years, I'm, I'm really pleased with the way it's going. How do you kind of have that long-term strategy, but also be reactive and, and kind of, you know, balance that? I think one of the things that's um, pretty important in business is just like the simple concept of like judgment. Mm -hmm. You know, the ability to make good decisions and, and be able to judge a situation, it just comes over a lot of time of building up data points on what works and what doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And I think people are often looking for sort of scientific or mathematical ways of sort of justifying decisions. Yeah. You know, they're like, if we scored it on these criteria and we applied this framework, that this would be the decision. Mm -hmm. And we I have think to be data driven. <laughs> yeah, and I think I think that you do want to be data driven. Like you, you have to collect a lot of these data yeah. points, but that kind of goes into our brains as like a judgment algorithm. Yep. Yeah. And I think that judgment algorithm then spits out you know an answer and so i think you absolutely do want to be cognizant of all the different data points it just may be not such that you can sort of write it down on a mm -hmm. mathematical spreadsheet and hand it over to someone yeah which i must say is hard as as a company gets bigger more and more people want that because you know people can say well why this way not, not, not that way yeah judgment is kind of the absolutely critical thing like if you can give yourself advice to eight years ago or ten years ago to yourself what would you say? If you've read a book like Thinking Fast and Slow, Daniel Kahneman's mm -hmm. uh, book, being able to re reflect on yourself and know when you're just being, you know, sort of having an emotive reaction to something yep. or like a you know, sort of flight or flight response to something versus like what is actually the right thing to do here, yeah. I think is probably one of being the most, one of the most sort of like grounding things for me because you're able to sort of like be in a situation and just kind of reflect on yourself and say, hmm, am I doing this because, you know, I'm having a freak out and a meltdown, <laughs> which is kind of emotional, yeah. which by the way is still completely valid. Mm -hmm versus, you know, am I logically responding to this? And I think, you know, I've been surprised like so many people or many people like find it hard to differentiate between those two things. Yeah. That's probably been one of the formative things uh, that I've been able to sort of pick up on is being able to reflect on your own self and, and look at the way you're doing something as a bit of an outsider. Mm -hmm. I think another one along the similar lines is um, curiosity over judgment, which I think is like a really, really good framing of just, you know, when you're saying something, listen to yourself saying it mm -hmm. and kind of wonder whether you're saying it in a way of, you've already made up your mind, this is the truth, yeah. or whether you're coming at something and going, hmm, how does this work? Mm -hmm. I want to know how this works. And I think the more that you can be curious 
and try to figure out how things are work rather than just bringing your own beliefs into things. Yeah. And um, that's that's super powerful. At some point though, your beliefs are valid. Yeah. So it's totally okay to make judgment at some point. Yeah. But I think approaching situations, trying to approach it more with curiosity mm -hmm. and before you make up your mind. Yeah. yeah. And what's um Tim Fung's superpower? Like, why do you think you've gotten to where you are now? <laughs> Other than being curious and, and you, I guess what you've said, but why is it that whenever I ask you for advice, I get an answer and I think in my head, I'm like, damn, that was obvious. Mm. But at the same time, it's not obvious. Like, and, and, which, which, is, which is like effectively what you said about air taskers kind of moat, right? Where you've, you've done a lot of intuitive things that make sense. That just describes you as a person. So I want to understand like, what's your superpower? Like, I, I don't know if this is like a superpower. And you know, saying superpower probably similar to saying the entrepreneur thing. Like you're an entrepreneur, <laughs> right? You know, people are like, oh dude. Now I would say one of the things I try to do a lot is, is first principles. And actually, you know, when we start a family and all that kind of thing, like what do I want? want to teach I think it would be that it would be mm -hmm. like think of things at the absolute base level as soon mm -hmm. as people start saying oh it's just that way because that's how it is or they start using jargon to mm -hmm. explain things I think you should always question that and wonder why because I think that's the only way that we can get better and keep evolving so I'd say having the ability to look at things at first principles and question things from first principles and be bothered to go and understand first principles is, is probably um, you know where I pride myself on I wanted to ask you, right? Because I know you, you're, you're a big hype beast. Well, like I said, a, a closeted hype beast. You don't like to show it, but what's your favorite hype beast item that you own? I have a livestock collab Arcteric uh, Anorak. Yeah, I remember you telling me about that. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty cool. So my thing is wearing jackets, which are way more, like, which are going to live longer than me. <laughs> <laughs> Where'd you get it? What's the uh, story it's a behind Canadian that? brand. Dead, yeah. I think it's Livestock or Deadstock. I can't remember what they're mm -hmm. called, but they basically somehow did a collab with, with Arcteryx and it's actually kind of got a street vibe because Arcteryx is actually pretty sort of legit mountaineering yeah. sort of gear and they don't do that much street stuff. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, I, I saw it and I was like, sick. Oh, okay. I feel like a lot of what you say always in hindsight obvious, mm. but then I would never have thought of it. And I mean, that's, that's where I'm always like, where does Tim come up with all these things? Like, <laughs> like you know, sometimes, sometimes we're in a meeting and we're, we're chatting and you come up with something that sounds genius. And I'm like, how did you think so quickly on your feet to say something like that? And I'm just like, I reckon it's just like you do shit long enough. <laughs> like, oh, it's like chat GPT, you know? Like it just rolls off <laughs> the previous word. <laughs> no, but thank you so much for coming in. It was, it was a pleasure chatting to you and, and you're always, it's always a pleasure to talk to you and you're one of my, I'll say, I consider you a close friend now. Um, and, and a really great mentor and I don't think we'd be able to do what we do without having your advice but thanks for coming in and hopefully you enjoy watching this episode and I think um, a lot of people will be interested to, to hear your journey because I don't think you actually go out and do any press to tell your story right which but you're, you're you're an Aussie success story right like not many Aussie entrepreneurs have made it to your level so thanks for coming in and thanks for doing this thanks for having me we'll chat soon and you know uh, hopefully I'll, I'll be lucky one day <laughs> that's the goal you know I'm always gonna be like Get to team level. Lucky that I'm innocent. Uh, if I didn't uh, have no morals, I'd be menacing. Uh, how about look rapping conscious, but he ignorant? Uh, how you find a hope, but still gon' go legitimate? Uh, how you fuck a bunch of but they still respect the 